Now, as I've uh, listened to the talks and as I look out into the audience and actually see some, good morning, some um, rather famous psychiatrists, it recalled uh, my uh, somewhat failed medical school career uh, for, I went to medical school and I wanted to become a psychiatrist. But during my first clinical rotation in medical school, my clinical incompetence was immediately recognized and I was called in by the dean who uh, offered to allow me to graduate from medical school if I promised never ever to practice medicine on live patients. <laughs> and, and I agreed happily um, and um, I did an internship in pathology to keep my promise and the chair of pathology came to me after a year of uh, autopsies and offered to certify me in pathology if I promised never ever to practice medicine on dead patients. <laughs> and so I stand before you um, uh, to talk to you uh, about uh, a problem in neuroscience, uh, a, a rather elusive problem, the problem of how the sensory world is represented in the brain. Now, I'd like you to think about this problem because it's an utterly astonishing problem. Because the sensory world con consists of a set of physical properties, wavelengths of light that encompass vision, frequencies of sound, uh, chemical structures that make for smell and taste. But how can you possibly represent these quantifiable physical parameters in a brain that simply has one thing in it, neurons. And these neurons can only do one meaningful thing, that is they can fire. They elicit an electrical discharge to allow communication among themselves. And moreover, they can only vary in their firing, in their spiking, <clears throat> in two parameters, time and space. So this world out there, this rich world that we experience, has to be represented by this monotonic array of neurons. And in fact, as I will tell you, the representation of the world in the brain bears no physical resemblance to the world outside of it. So the brain is abstracting the world. It is as much an abstraction as a piece of abstract art that attempts to relay a rather figurative image in completely disordered forms and lines and colors. The brain, inside the brain, the firing of neurons bears no resemblance to the world. The brain is not a camera. There is no ensemble of neurons in the form of a square. When you see a square and recalling an image does not recapitulate the action of a movie camera. This is an astonishingly complex problem that I will not solve for you. But how, do we, how does one address this problem? Now this problem uh, is interesting and it's been considered um, in the past for over 3,000 years. Plato in his Republic considered this problem in what is known as the allegory of the cave in which prisoners see no aspect of the world but rather only see shadows. And it oppose, imposes the question of illusion and reality. Indeed, um, one of the temptations of having a brain is to try and use it to solve the mystery of its own nature. It's tempting, it's been tempting to think that the nature of thinking could be uncovered by thinking alone. 
Philosophers tried this from the beginning of recorded history. And then the philosophers were joined by the psychologists, the sociologists, the, econo the economists. But we haven't fared very well. And so the biologists entered the fray. And we still remain at a very primitive level of understanding. But how do we begin to approach this problem as a biologist? So let me try and describe to you the nature of the representation of smell. We've already heard a great deal about smell. I'm going to talk about a different nose than Noam has talked about. In reality, most mammals, perhaps not humans, have two noses. They have a main nose called the main olfactory epithelium, which resides in the posterior recess of the nose. And then they have a separate nose called the vomeronasal organ. Other people call it the erotic nose. And that's responsible for many of the named effects that Noam talked about. And interestingly, as we will see, these two noses project to different parts of the brain. The erotic nose, the vomeronasal organ, projects to a part of the brain already described, the emotive brain, the amygdala, whereas the main nose projects to multiple areas, including cognitive brain. So let's consider this. My student, Linda Baca, I, I, I'm going to talk about work done by many students. Um, and that's because I'm a very religious man, um, and I do nothing. Um, and as it is written in Leviticus, the work of the righteous is done by others. Um, so my student identified about um, uh, the genes that encode the receptors that sit on the tips of the neurons in your nose that recognize the world, odors in the environment. Remarkably, Linda observed that there are in most mammals, at least a thousand genes encoding odorant receptors. You only have 20,000 genes in your chromosome, for so over 5% of the information in your chromosome is dedicated to the recognition of odors. A remarkable observation consistent with the importance of smell for the survival and reproduction of most animal species. Here, we got very fortunate. It turned out that you have many millions of neurons in your nose, but each neuron makes only one of these receptors. And a given odor will activate 50 of these receptors. Each neuron in the nose sends a process back to the brain and all the neurons that express the same kind of receptor send their process to a fixed point in the brain. If you have a thousand receptors, you have a thousand points. Are we together? Remarkable. Okay. An odor comes along, it activates 50 receptors in the nose. 50 out of 1,000, the number of possible combinations is about 10 with 23 zeros after it. That's the number of different odors you can discriminate. Um, and so an odor come, comes along, it activates 50 receptors. And what um, we then observe is that it activates a unique set of 50 points in the first relay station in the brain. There it is. Every odor activates a different 50 points. And I, using 
sophisticated microscopy that allows the resolution of neural activity, which is about 10,000 times greater than what you see with fMRI, can look into this part of the brain and discern the nature of the odor that the organism has encountered. But that's great. But the brain doesn't have this fancy microscope in it. And so the next question is how does the brain actually look down on this map and interpret the activity? And here things get very interesting. The information from this first relay, it's called a bulb in the brain, goes to many brain regions. It pentafricates. I want to discuss two very quickly. One, region, one projection goes to the amygdala, and the spatial map of the bulb is transformed but retained in the amygdala, and this maintenance of space allows this projection to the amygdala to mediate innate behavioral responses. So there are a small number of behavioral responses that in response to the world that are innate. If you think about it, the vast majority of sensory experiences that you encounter have no meaning to you. So we have a small set of innate responses. Another projection goes to high brain, cognitive brain, olfactory cortex. And that projection no longer maintains the laws of space. That is, the projection is totally random for every odor, and every odor gives you a different distribution, and most importantly, that distribution is different in every individual. That is wild, because what this means to a neuroscientist is that that distribution is random and can have no, and can come with no meaning whatsoever. That says that most sensory, the vast majority of your sensory experience has absolutely no significance to you. Whether it be the image of a field or a beautiful woman or the smell of um, a lemon, it has no meaning to you. And meaning must be imposed by learning or experience. That's wild, because what I'm arguing almost is that these sensory cortices are a tabula rasa. They're a blank slate in which neural information is collected and entrained. It's entrained by the learning experience. And so let me very quickly summarize this somewhat um, uh, uh, elusive notion that is what I have tried to describe to you is that there are two pathways of information from the nose to the brain. One which uses space, the particular position of neurons, to encode innate behavioral responses. If you activate neurons dorsally on top, you will lead to aversive behavior. If you activate neurons on the bottom, you will generate appetitive behavior. And then there's this cognitive brain, this cortical region, in which the information is randomized and can have no meaning. That's called a bottom-up process. That bottom-up process, which generates this random representation of active neurons, has no meaning, and therefore it is incomplete and it must be filled in by a higher order, top-down process, which imposes valence, value, 
on that meaning, on that information. And as a consequence, then, the vast majority of the sensory information coming into your brain from the world forms a substrate of no meaning upon which experience, expectation, emotion serves to shape the way you perceive the world. As a consequence, everybody's perception of the world is likely to be uniquely personal and quite different. And as a consequence, not all of us, upon the smell of a Madeleine, will put forth seven volumes of remembrances of things past, as it did for Marcel Proust. Thank you.